Good afternoon. I hope everybody had a good Halloween. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Cold War today. This is what we should have done on Thursday, but of course, with the storm and people having their their power out and internet out, I'm only just now getting to record this, so I apologize for the delay. Um, so let's get into this real quick. Um, Got to start with Europe after Cold or after World War II ends to really understand where the Cold War starts. Uh, you got to figure there were armies all over Europe, the, the Allied Army, the Russian Army, the Nazi Army, and Europe is devastated after the war is over. And the devastation after World War II is worse than World War I simply because of new technologies. There's new types of bombs, there's new types of aircraft, you name it, there's new types of tanks, new types of war. And because of all the devastation after World War II is over, there are real worries that another depression is going to happen. It's not going to be that way, though. And a big part of it is the Marshall Plan that's developed by George C. Marshall, the U.S. Secretary of State, a former general during the war. And he comes up with this idea to give money to Western Europe to help them rebuild. And this Marshall Plan is going to give $12 billion in aid to all the countries in Western Europe. If you were to scale that up to today, that's $130 billion. Uh, it was also offered to the Soviet Union and Eastern European countries as well, but they turned it down mostly because the Soviet Union would not let them. Now, the plan with this money was to rebuild the countries, rebuild the infrastructure, rebuild industry, and just really help any way that they can. It removed trade barriers, and the Marshall Plan is going to lead to the European Union on a long enough road. The United Nations is also developed after World War II, and that becomes a place where all the different countries can solve their problems peacefully. And for the most part, it's done a good job. There have been a couple of things here and there, but no large-scale conflict since it came into being. Uh, there are some wars that happen based on ideology, and that's where the Cold War comes in. The Cold War is really a war between capitalism and communism. Now, what are the origins of the Cold War? You got this struggle for post-war Europe. And a lot of it, this struggle for post-war Europe is going to start with the Potsdam Conference we talked about last time we met. If you remember, um, the right in April of 1945, the different people, uh, you know, Britain, the Soviet Union, the United States are all meeting to try and figure out what Europe's going to look like afterwards, and there's not a whole lot of agreement. The Soviet Union is also going to try to push communism and expand communism, and the West realizes, you know what, we're not going to be able to stop it. Another origin of the Cold War, and this is really important, I'm going to ask you this on the final exam, there's no question at all. Uh, it's the Truman Doctrine of 1947. What the Truman Doctrine says, and do memorize this. The U.S. must support free peoples around the world who are resisting efforts by outsiders or armed minorities to overthrow their government. So that Truman Doctrine, again, you can read it. The U.S. must support free peoples around the world who are resisting efforts by outsiders or armed minorities to overthrow their governments. In other words, Harry Truman, the president in 1947, says we're going to stop communism. We're going to contain communism no matter what it takes. Another origin of the Cold War is found in alliances. It might sound familiar. Alliances led to World War I. In many ways, alliances led to World War II. And alliances are going to play a big part in the Cold War. I have four Western alliances there. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It still exists, and the United States is part of it. You've got CETO, which is the Southeast Atlantic Treaty Organization. ANZUS. Australia, New Zealand, United States, and then finally OAS, the Organization of American States. 
And the OAS, we're not talking about the 50 states of the U.S. We're talking about North America, Central America, and South America. That's the Alliance of the Americas. The Communist Alliance is the Warsaw Pact, and that's going to be the Soviet Union, that's going to be North Korea, that's going to be Cuba eventually, and it's going to be all of the Eastern European countries. China, yes, they are communist by this time, but communist China is seen as an outsider by the communist Soviet Union, primarily because their idea of communism comes from a different place. Now, Cold War battlefields, there are some battlefields that happen, but they're not physical battlefields. Uh, they're, they're battlefields for control and of ideas. First of all, battles in third world nations. Now, today a lot of people think of the third world as being underdeveloped, poor countries, and that's partially true, but not always true. Originally, the idea of a third world nation just meant other. It's a country that's not in the democratic it's not a country that's in the communist side of things it's kind of in the middle it is an other column if you will a third world now who are the third world countries they're going to be places that are developing uh, they have a lot of manpower they have a lot of resources but they don't have very good political organization and they may not have a lot of economic development so yes you do find a lot of third world countries in Africa but that's primarily because of, of um, colonization. Another big part of the Cold War is found in nuclear weapons. Now, the United States is the only country in the history of the world to use a nuclear weapon against enemies. And the enemy that we used it against was Japan. Um, Hopefully, the United States will be the only country to ever use those against an enemy, but we shall see. Now, the Soviet Union does develop nuclear weapons, and they do it in 1949. And they're helped by, by groups of people who spied on the American project, on the Manhattan project. Now, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are the two most famous spies. Uh, they were not the primary spies, though. In fact, there's arguments out there that say they didn't really know what was going on and that they were more of figureheads or used as scapegoats, if, as you will. Uh, no matter what it was, though, several people were arrested in the early 50s for spying on the nuclear program. The Rosenbergs were actually um, killed or... Um, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? They were condemned to death, and the government carried out a death sentence against them. By the end of the 1960s, there are six countries with nuclear capability. Uh, there's the United States, there's the Soviet Union, there's France, there's China, there is Great Britain, and then there's India. India is one of those third world nations, and they develop nuclear weapons to protect themselves from both sides of the argument. Today there are a couple more countries that have nuclear capabilities. In addition to those six, uh, there's also Israel, Pakistan, and North Korea. There's one country that voluntarily gave up their nuclear weapons, and that is South America. South America used to be nuclear capable, but now they are not. Now, these nuclear weapons have become an arms race. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union continually produce more and more nuclear bombs and bigger and bigger nuclear bombs and different types of nuclear weapons as well. There's fission bombs, there's fusion bombs, those are the original two, and then there's hydrogen bombs uh, that explode hydrogen, neutron bombs, which are um, bombs that do uh, like radiation damage, and then cobalt salt bombs were also tested, which was meant to spread radiation over a gigantic territory. Now, the largest bomb ever tested was done in 1961, October 30th, 1961, by the Soviet Union. It was called the Tsar Bomba, and that weapon alone had more destructive power than every single bomb dropped in World War II. 
Now, the United States is going to adopt a policy called mutual assured destruction. Basically, um, shoot first, ask questions later. If the United States detected a an attack from the Soviet Union, the red button, so to speak, would be pushed, and then we would figure it out later. And during the Cold War, it's really this fear of mutual assured destruction, this idea that both sides can wipe each other out that stops nuclear weapons from being used. Uh, um, if you talk to your parents or maybe even your grandparents at this point, and they grew up during the Cold War, uh, they'll tell you that the American government made it seem like the race was even or that the Soviets had the upper hand. In reality, the United States had four nuclear weapons for every one the Soviet Union owned. Space is a very big Cold War battlefield, and it's probably the most obvious one. Um, because there's this race to put a man in the moon, there's this race to put a, a um, space lab in, in space and everything else. The Soviet Union is going to launch the first satellite in 1957, and it's called Sputnik. It was about the size of a Volkswagen Bug. And all it did was circle the Earth and let out a ping that could be heard on the radio. But it launched this concern because suddenly everybody thought there were going to be space lasers and, and uh, space weapons and everything else. So it creates a panic in the United States. Very soon after, both the United States and the Soviet Union begin testing animals. And the United States is going to use monkeys. The Soviet Union is going to use dogs. Now, you can see the picture there on the bottom right slide. That is the dog Laika. Uh, Laika was the first animal in outer space. Laika was a street dog from the Soviet Union, from Moscow. She was captured and then trained how to eat in space. Unfortunately, she, once she leaves the Earth, she does not come back. She dies in orbit. Uh, the first monkey that was sent to space is stuffed and preserved and on display at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. Once it's proven that you can send animals to space, both sides start working on people. The Soviet Union trains what they call cosmonauts. The U.S. trains astronauts. And there's this race to get the first human to orbit the Earth. The Soviet Union wins with Yuri Gagarin launching into space on the Vostok 1 on April 12, 1961. The United States will get a man into space almost a year later. Uh, John Glenn, who goes on to become a senator, uh, he flies in space for the first time on February 20, 1962. John F. Kennedy is going to promise to put the first man on the moon. He says that the U.S. will put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And the whole American space program is focused on that one goal. So you get the Mercury program where they learn how to get people up and down safely, the Gemini program where they learn how to orbit the Earth safely, and then the Apollo missions, which are going to be what gets man to the moon and back. Now, the Apollo missions alone, there are, I believe, 12 of them cost $25 billion. Now, how big was that in the 1960s? 5% of the entire American budget was devoted to Apollo. Finally, Apollo 11 lands on the moon July 20th, 1969. Neil Armstrong is the first man to set foot on the moon. He very famously says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And then Buzz Aldrin is the second person to step on the moon. There was actually a third person on the mission. Most people don't remember him, so I always try to give us him credit. Michael Collins. Michael Collins was still on the Apollo 11 monitoring everything that was happening down on the moon's surface. We have the Korean War. This is one of the few hot spots that actually break out into fighting. Uh, after World War II, Korea is divided in half. 
the Soviet Union has control of the top half, the United States has control of the bottom half. There are plans to reunite the two Koreas after elections are held, but those elections never do happen. Uh, the Soviet Union thinks that the the American side will win, the American side thinks the Soviets will win, and so there's kind of this standoff and these two different countries develop. A, a man named Kim Il-sung is the one picked by the Soviet Union to lead Korea. A man named Syngman Rhee is picked to lead Korea by the United States. And then in 1950, the Soviet Union encourages Kim Il-sung to launch an attack on the southern part of Korea. And this was for a couple different reasons. Number one, if Kim Il-sung wins, the Soviets get a new ally in the area. Number two, it would show both China and Japan how strong the Soviet Union was if they could help create this new country. And then a third reason actually can be traced back to the United States Secretary of State, a guy named Dean Acheson. Uh, Dean Acheson publicly makes a speech that says Korea is no longer important to the interests of the U.S. And the Soviet Union is like, hey, that's our green light to go ahead and attack. Now, eventually the war will turn into a stalemate. Neither side wins, but there's also no formal peace treaty. Technically the Korean War is still happening today, and that's part of why Korea is in the news so often. Uh, also, if you have ever seen the TV show MASH, MASH actually takes place during the Korean War, even though a lot of people think it's about the Vietnam War. Some other events that happened during the Cold War, the first one is you have the Berlin Airlift, and I've got here two pictures that kind of describe what happens to Germany after World War II ends. Germany is divided into different parts, and each one of those different colors is a different part of Germany. The red part is controlled by the Soviet Union. The green part controlled by Great Britain. The blue part is controlled by France. And the orange part is controlled by the United States. And then other portions of Germany belong to other countries, whether they are permanent countries or temporary. The bottom picture is the city of Berlin itself. And just like greater Germany is divided, Berlin itself is divided into different portions as well. Now, in 1948, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, decides he wants to cut off the city of Berlin from the rest of Germany. And the reason they wanted to do that is they wanted control of the entire city of Berlin. The only way to get into Berlin once the road access was shut off was by airplane. So from July of 1948 and for the next for the next 10 months I should say over two and a half million tons of supplies are going to be shipped by air into the city of Berlin um, that's going to equal 1500 tons of food per day and almost 3500 tons of fuel per day and if it wasn't for this airlift this convoy of airplanes uh, the city of Berlin would have fallen into Soviet hands. Next, you have NSC-68. NSC stands for National Security Council, and this was a report that was released in 1950. Um, this is also very important. This goes along with the Truman Doctrine. Uh, the government report states that the U.S. must take the lead in stopping communism wherever it occurred regardless of the intrinsic, strategic, or economic value of that area to the United States. To translate that and make it simple to understand, the United States makes a commitment to stop communism wherever communism happens. Communism happens in Korea, we're going to try to stop it. If it tries to happen in Greece, we'll, we'll stop it. If it happens in Vietnam, we'll stop it. If it happens in your bathtub, we'll stop it. No matter how big or how small, the U.S. is going to fight communism. How does this affect us in 2020? Well, America has the largest military today. In fact, the American military budget today is six times bigger than the next largest budget. So 
there's going to be this huge expansion of American military power. There's going to be this huge expansion of military spending. So it still affects us today, even if the overall threat of communism is gone. Briefly, China. Uh, there's a civil war that happens in China. It starts in 1927, and it goes all the way until 1949. On the communist side, Mao Zedong is leading it, and on the national side, you have a guy named Chiang Kai-shek. There is a pause in the fighting during World War II, but at the end of 1945, the Civil War begins again. The communists defeat the nationalists in 1949. The nationalist government and their supporters leave the mainland and settle in Taiwan and set up a government there. Uh, so Taiwan is what's left of the pre-communist China. Now, to make this even more strange, the United States refuses to recognize China as China, and up until the 1970s, the small island of Taiwan was considered the real China. Uh, that changes when Richard Nixon visits the communist country. Massive deterrence versus flexible response. Massive Deterrence is a program that's developed by Dwight D. Eisenhower while he's president. And if you don't know much about Eisenhower, he was the supreme allied commander in World War II. He was the one in charge of the entire military of the, of the allies. So he believed in overwhelming victory. He believed in overwhelming odds. And you can see that in Massive Deterrence. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower said if war breaks out, we will use everything in our arsenal to stop them. We will use massive retaliation. And Dwight D. Eisenhower is the one who says, you know what, it's perfectly okay to use nuclear weapons if we have to. Eisenhower will be replaced by JFK. And JFK, he believes in flexibility. He doesn't think that nuclear weapons need to be used first. So JFK is going to use conventional military weapons, and he is going to deploy small numbers of troops to fight communism all around the world as needed. Now, before I go to the next slide, I want to give you a secret word. This secret word is going to be something you have to give me on a quiz that you'll find in Blackboard. And the secret word that I need to give you in honor of the death of Sean Connery, the original James Bond, today's secret word will be Goldfinger. Goldfinger is, in my opinion, the best of the James Bond movies. Goldfinger is probably some of Sean Connery's best acting. And if you have never seen the movie Goldfinger, I highly suggest that you do that. I know it was 1960s. I know it's a little bit dated, but it is still very, very good. Okay, Cuba have to talk about Cuba, because Cuba is going to be a big part of the Cold War. And it's kind of a what had happened was story. So what had happened was, in the 1950s, there's a dictator who's going to take over Cuba, and it's a dictator named Fulgencio Batista. Uh, Batista was not communist, which is why he was supported by the United States, but he wasn't really a democratic guy either. He was a dictator in the truest sense. The people of Cuba did not like him. And in 1959, there's a guy named Fidel Castro who starts a rebellion and decides to get a group of people together to overthrow Fulgencio Batista. Originally, uh, Fidel Castro, he came to America. He talked about what he wanted to do. He even went on the Ed Sullivan show and met in the White House with government officials. And at first, the United States supported him until Fidel Castro started to say socialist and communist things. And at that time, communism bad. It didn't matter why communism was happening. So the United States said, nope, you're a bad guy. When Fidel Castro overthrows Batista, a lot of people flee from Cuba into places like Florida. And the United States is going to come up with this idea 
of launching a counter-revolution. So there's this plan being created by the CIA to take anti-Castro exiles and use American military equipment to, re to invade Cuba and overthrow Castro and maybe put Padista back in power. Well, JFK is elected president, and JFK comes to power in 1961. He finds this plan about invading Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, and he's convinced to go ahead and do this plan, even though he's not sure if it's a good idea. Uh, he's convinced by the CIA, the Cuban exiles, and even the mafia gets involved and say, you know what, you got to do this. So JFK says, okay. The invasion happens. It's a gigantic failure. The Cuban government knows it's going to happen. All of the invaders are captured on the beach of southern Cuba. Kennedy is going to go on TV and accept the blame, but he doesn't apologize because he feels it's the job of the United States to stop communism. Well, fast forward a year later to October of 1962, and you have the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, a spy plane is going to fly over Cuba and discover that the Soviets are building a missile base, and it's very likely this missile base was going to have nuclear weapons. Well, Cuba's only about an hour south, maybe an hour and a half south of Miami, so it, it was very, very close. So Kennedy goes on TV, publicly acknowledges, hey, this is what is happening, and Kennedy demands that the missiles be removed. And then Kennedy says, if you don't remove the missiles voluntarily, we'll remove them for you. So Kennedy threatens war. Uh, the Soviet premier, a guy named Nikita Khrushchev, uh, his name's not terribly important, so I didn't put it up there, but you can always look it up or read the textbook. Uh, his name is Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, Khrushchev is going to try and get the missiles ready to launch. Basically, Khrushchev is going to try and call Kennedy's bluff. Um, the United States is going to surround the island, and the United States is going to threaten to invade Cuba. Um, it looks like the world is on the brink of war, but at the last second, both sides decide to talk things out, and a settlement is reached right at the last minute as the entire world thinks that um, war is going to happen. In the end, both sides agree to talk more often, and this becomes something called detente. It's a French word. And detente, basically both sides are going to agree to negotiate. Both sides are going to agree to try and talk out future problems. And a hotline, a phone line, is put in the White House and a phone line is put in the Kremlin so that both the Soviet Union and the United States can talk whenever it's needed. Um, eventually, out of this idea of detente are going to become uh, nuclear weapon limitations, a reduction in arms, and a warming of the Cold War, even though the Cold War doesn't stop. Um, so, there's more about the Cold War, but that's about as much as I could get in here in one lecture. It's almost been 30 minutes. I know you don't want to listen any further. I will talk a little bit about the Vietnam War in a week or two, so stay tuned for that, and we'll get to do that in person. But until then, enjoy your Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, make sure you get your work done by Wednesday night, and don't forget your your reflection paper, don't forget to be working on your SLO, and don't forget to do your museum review. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.